morning, everybody, and thank you so much for, uh, for giving of your time. This is um, the whole issue of publishing individual uh, results is one that attracts really pretty mixed responses. And what I'm going to do rather than um, steal any of the thunder from subsequent speakers is kind of set the, um, the scene for how we've got to this place. It's a mixture of emotion, it's a mixture of politics, and it's a mixture of pragmatism. And the story, I think, really goes back to around about 2000, 2001, when the Bristol Royal Infirmary inquiry was reporting on, um, on events that had happened with excess deaths among a certain subgroup of children in Bristol. And at that time, Alan Milburn was the Secretary of State. There was a, uh, a very significant and influential person who was a, uh, a special advisor to the Prime Minister on Health at the time, who now works in North America. And there were a lot of recommendations that came out of the Bristol Royal Infirmary Inquiry, 198, and two of them were very similar. And what they said, in essence, if you coalesced them, was that the public should have access to the results of surgical teams. And by the time that had been processed through the Department of Health and, um, and put in front of advisors at number 10, the interpretation or the spirit of that began to change. And the reason it began to change was because the special advisor who worked in Downing Street was married to an American, and the American had a brother who was a cardiac surgeon who worked on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And in what I guess was family discussion, he said, well, of course, he said, in New York and Pennsylvania, we just publish the results of surgeons. Well, you can imagine how that kind of started to influence the thinking in number 10. And then there were a series of kind of complicated discussions with Mr. Milburn about the publication of uh, cardiac surgeons' results. And uh, I was intimately involved in that because I was, I think, Secretary of the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons at the time. And I made every single argument against it that anybody in this room could even begin to conjure up. We wrote to the newspapers, we argued wherever we could, and eventually, the fact that the public were on the side of it, the fact that there was political weight behind it, and the fact that somehow or other people who were doing unspeakable things to other people could hide what their results were uh, became an absolutely untenable position. So we, we realized that, and, um, and we went to the Healthcare Commission, where I was a commissioner at the time, and Ian Kennedy, by then, had become chair of the, of the Healthcare Commission, and we said, could you help us with this? because if we, as a bunch of surgeons, publish these results, then we will be seen to be doing magic, you know, covering things up. And so we need, we need the influence of an independent arbitrator to, to help with the presentation. And the end result of that was that we got to a position where we agreed that we would publish individual surgeons' results on the Healthcare <laughs> Commission website. <clears throat> and while we were thinking about that, I got a phone call um, from a newspaper. And they said, um, they said, you know the results of all the surgeons in the country? And I said, yes. And they said, we're, we're putting in an FOI request. I said, well, tough. I said, we don't receive a single penny of public funding. So they went to the, to the Health Care Commission, and I think some of the people are in this room who dealt with this, and they found some clause in the, in the legislation which enabled them, again, to rebut the approach from the newspaper, which was The Guardian. And before we knew it, I started to get phone calls from people in trusts saying, The Guardian have put in an FOI request to, to every trust asking for the results of surgeons. And of course, the trusts are not going to fight that particular corner for, the, for a handful of surgeons, four, five, six surgeons that might be working. So they immediately gave the, the data to the, to the Guardian. And in the first pass of the data, it was, it was rubbish, really. It was people used different years. Some used calendar years. Some used financial years. Some used risk-adjusted data. Some used raw data. Some included redo operations. Some didn't. 
And then Ben Bridgewater, working behind the scenes for The Guardian, said, you're asking the wrong questions. So they came back with another set of questions. And the end result was that before we got stuff up on the Healthcare Commission website, it was a big spread in The Guardian. And that taught us that um, there's something unassailable in this argument. And then we, we made it voluntary for, uh, for the cardiac surgeons, although through the Healthcare Commission we made the publication of, of, um, of unit-based data mandatory. And it started off with about 75% of surgeons, eventually grew to about 85%. And then when I became uh, medical director of the NHS, the story started again. Every year from Downing Street, there was this desire to have individual surgeons' results published. And I fought it off for some time. But we've now got to a position where several things have coalesced. First of all, we've put something like £14 million into clinical audit. This is public money. And people want to see some results. From, um, from the clinical audits. Secondly, there's a, a very, very high-level political push for all, data, all government data to be made available to the public, to the extent that Tim Berners-Lee, who is, you know, as many of you know, the inventor of the World Wide Web, the guy that devised HTML and sits on the World Wide Web consortium and all that kind of stuff, he's over here helping the government tag data so that it can be processed and... Um, and accessed easily over the internet. Thirdly, every government department has been instructed uh, by the Prime Minister to develop a transparency panel to see what data can be made available to the public. And the transparency panel in the Department of Health has had to grapple with a lot of issues about the sorts of data that it puts out. But the, the drive is really very, very strong. In terms of clinical audit data, the, um, the view is that clinical audit data, the raw data, should be made ultimately publicly available. And the deal that we've done to prevent that being, if you like, um, analyzed and presented in the wrong way by the wrong people is to ensure that, people, that we will develop a system where people who need access to this data have to do it in conjunction with those that run the clinical audits. And that's worked quite well in some clinical audits which have, have already done it. Um, and then finally, there's been a, a kind of growing demand, if you like, from, from the media for this kind of information. But in my head that's all kind of negative pressure. I, I firmly believe, and many of you will have heard me say this, that anybody that does something to somebody else that carries risk should be able to describe what they do and define how well they do it. And if you can't do that, I think you forfeit a large part of your professionalism, and I think you should really consider whether you forfeit the right to do whatever it is you're doing to other people. In other words, you should know your results and you should be prepared to be held accountable for those results. Now, I know that there are significant issues of teamwork around this, but most of the, the specialties which we're talking about are surgical specialties for the cardiologists, and I see some cardiologists in the room, and, and I'll say this only once, they get quite close to being surgeons, um, they, I've lost my train of thought. Claire, what was I saying? <laughs> um, I think, I think it's, it's really important that you should be, you should be held accountable uh, for what you do. And over the last 18 months, I've been horrified by the battering the NHS has taken. I've seen morale plummet because, um, uh, because of media and, uh, and political onslaughts. And we're about to enter into an electoral cycle where some aspects of that will get worse and some aspects of it will get better. But I learned one thing fairly early on when, um, when Tim Kelsey and I were asked to set up NHS Choices by Patricia Hewitt some years ago. Um, 
we had to work out what kind of information to put on there. And then when I became NHS medical director, I was asked to get some kind of meaningful outcome data onto NHS choices. So it, I'd learned a little bit from the Veterans Administration. One of the guys that had, uh, Ken Kaiser, who had been head of the Veterans Administration, had come in and he had asked for mortality data on, on uh, orthopedic procedures, vascular procedures, and a couple of other things. And, um, and by doing so, he had uncovered some units that shouldn't be doing, whatever it was, and then they argued about the data, and he said, well, if it's only a data issue, you can resolve it quickly, but meantime, stop what you're doing. And so I picked very much a similar sort of list to the list he had used, and that was we decided to publish mortality for hip replacement, knee replacement, abdominal aortic aneurysms, and, uh, and something else. And we wrote to trusts and said, this is the data we have, what we think you've done, and um, these are the results. Could you confirm whether they're correct before we publish them? And the trust wrote back and they said yes. And of course, we were using HERS data. And then my... Um, my son got engaged, and it turned out that the father of, um, of the girl he was getting engaged to was a vascular surgeon. And I met him, and he said, are you that bloke that's uh, responsible for that rubbish on NHS choices? And I said, yeah, what's the problem? He said, well, it says I've only done that number of cases. He said, I've done three times that amount. It's got my mortality wrong. And then letters started to come in. And what, complaining that the data was inaccurate, and what became absolutely clear to me was that the data that we were using what, is what was in the hospital information systems but bore no relation to the reality of what was going on in the operating theatre. So we subsequently instituted a process whereby the clinical service leads for the appropriate specialties had to sign the data off and we've gotten to a much better place. But herein also lies the strength of the clinical audits because they are owned by the specialist associations. They're owned by the... Um, the, the surgeons and clinicians who input the data, and they're clinically orientated in a way that administrative data isn't. And that's why I'm very keen that we use the, the clinical audit data for this, sort of, uh, for this sort of endeavor. It does raise a bunch of problems because not everybody submits to the clinical audits, but therein lies the opportunity because we will start to look at whether we should be commissioning services from places that don't contribute to the clinical audits, which receive um, 14 million pounds worth of, um, of public funds, particularly when we're going to use those clinical audits to support uh, commissioning, support, um, if you like, um, performance assessment within an organization, support revalidation, and provide information to support clinical excellence awards. So there are a lot of very good reasons why those people who are not currently contributing to clinical audits need to do so. And it will be incumbent on trust administrations to ensure that those people, for example, who are doing thyroids are submitting their data to the National Clinical Audit. Those people who are doing vascular surgery are submitting their data for peer review assessment by the Vascular Society. That's what clinical leadership is going to be about, and that's how we're going to drive quality. But to get back to the point about publishing the data on NHS choices, when we did that, what it demonstrated, when we collected this data, it demonstrated actually how well our NHS was doing. So whilst people are going to be very fearful about um, publishing this sort of data, the reality is the real thing that's going to come out of this is a confidence, a confidence that will enable surgeons who have submitted their data, I think, to walk with a bit of a swagger, knowing that the vast majority of people in this country are performing surgery to very high international standards. And therein lies the issue for me. Now, the problem is we've got to make that the story. There will be aspects of the media who don't want that to be the story. And that leads me into the next, the next part of this, which is one of the issues we had to grapple with um, is the issue of consent. It's in European law and in...
British law, we needed to seek consent for, um, uh, from individual surgeons for publishing this data. And we asked different groups of lawyers for their opinions. And there may be others who, who talk about this in more detail. And they said, it's absolutely right that you have to seek consent. And so we started to ask people, would they consent? And um, my figures may be slightly out of date, but something around 96, 97% of surgeons said that's fine. But that left us with a small rump of people who didn't want to consent, and they didn't want to consent for a variety of reasons. They thought the whole initiative was rubbish. They didn't think it was the right thing to do. They thought it drove a coach and horses through teamwork. Um, they were worried that they might be an outlier, all sorts of arguments. But the end result is that when the majority of people like that, with such a big majority, want to consent, that kind of shifts the weight of the law a bit and shifts it in the favor of the public interest. So we are now in a position where the public interest outweighs what those few surgeons think. And there will be others who talk about the, the solution to that during the day, I think, Ben. Um, so this, we're now in, um, in, in my view, uh, quite, quite a good place. So I think there's a massive opportunity for us here. There's a massive opportunity for us to, A, demonstrate that we, as a bunch of clinical leaders, and the first tranche of clinical audits that do this, our leaders, our pioneers, this has not been done anywhere else in the world, to demonstrate that our NHS is up for it, to demonstrate we're not frightened to stand up and be counted for the quality of the care that we offer and the outcomes that we give. And remember that one of the things that's come out of the the, um, the politics of the recent changes, and many people will have focused on the structural changes, but the philosophy behind a few, what you might call the Lansley changes of first, we will make clinical outcomes the currency of the NHS. Secondly, we will give much greater weight to clinical leadership, and then thirdly, we'll empower patients more. But this is about those first two. If we really believe, and I think of many years when I've sat in coffee rooms and people have said, if only the politicians would focus on outcomes and not all these rubbish targets. If only they would give us the leadership to do what we knew was right, we could get things right. Well, they've called our bluff. But by calling our bluff, I think they've given us a massive opportunity here. So whatever fears we may have, I think they are far, far outweighed um, by the opportunities for demonstrating the quality of care uh, that we offer. And the final thing I would like to say is that this hasn't been easy. Some of these audits have not been designed um, for the kind of purpose which they're going to be put to now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run next week with those audits that have really got substance. And for those audits where people are, 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 are worried or feel they're not quite ready, we're happy, to, um, we're happy to delay those. Um, but the majority will be, um, will be published. And Norman uh, Williams and I have had a, had a conversation. Um, and Norman will work with, with others to define which ones should go and which ones could possibly be held back. I've also had a discussion with Jeremy Hunt on that, just so that um, there isn't any, if you like, political disappointment which derails this. And he's very comfortable for that. But for those who, who worry about this being teamwork, um, can I just say that in my head, when a patient walks into a clinic, they see the person that's going to do the procedure. They don't see the physiotherapist in the room. They don't see the nurse in the room. They don't see the ITU consultant in the room. The deal, the compact they have for the outcome of the procedure they're going to undergo, they have that with the surgeon. And therefore, in my view, the surgeon, the person that perpetrates whatever procedure it is, is the person who is accountable for the outcomes. And therefore, that person has to be held accountable. And therefore, that we have an opportunity to demonstrate that we're prepared to stand up and, and be counted for our results. So on that note, um, I think well done to people who have worked really, really hard over the, um, over the last few weeks to make this a reality. Thanks very much.